I bought this cheap, it was broken. Uh, the previous owner had had enough trying to get this problem sorted. 2011 Ford Territory. Now this car went to several mechanics. They could not solve the problem. Problem was uh, limp home mode. The traction control light was on. Um, lights all over the dashboard, wouldn't go over 40 kilometers an hour, no power. I got this cheap without knowing what was wrong with it. So I took a gamble on being able to fix it. Is this what you're seeing? Check engine light followed by DSC fault. There are three common causes that I run through in this video. And I'll work through those in, <laughs> in order from easiest and cheapest. Number one, brakes. Your brake lights uh, and brake light switch. Number two, fuel. Fuel filter uh, and fuel pumps. Number three, EGR, the exhaust gas recirculation system. I will run through how you can do some testing for these. This is the 2.7 diesel. It was fitted to the Ford Territory uh, from 2011 to 2016. Same motor. Um, it's a Ford Peugeot motor, but it was also used a lot in the Land Rover and, and the Jaguar XF. Uh, let's see, so it's it's the 2.7 uh, Ford Lion motor. I believe it was fitted to the Land Rover, the Discovery 3, the TD V6. Um, and, and there must have been a Range Rover, equivalent Range Rover as well. Jaguar XF, um, I'm not sure when they changed over to the 3 litre, must have been uh, late 2000s. Uh, and uh, Peugeot HTIs, they use this as well. Number one brake lights believe it or not if your um if your bulbs or your um uh, your, your brake pedal sensor are gone they can trigger all these problems it gets a mismatch between brake pressure and uh, and the brake light trigger that'll cause this problem have you replaced the brake master cylinder recently if you have that can uh cause problems i did see a post uh, one guy had replaced the brake master cylinder. The replacement part had a slightly longer push rod. Brake pedal was generating pressure before it was triggering the brake light switch and the vehicle wasn't happy with that. Of course you're going to have failure of the, uh, the brake light switch itself. Where are we? We're up here. That, this one up here. Blue and white. Okay, above the brake pedal. And, and that can produce an intermittent fault. Um, sometimes if the vehicle has been sitting for a while, it'll develop a bit of corrosion on the contacts there each time and, um, and, and not generate a signal when you push on the brake. The next one we'll consider is the fuel filter. Now in the Land Rovers, it's uh, on the underbody, it's a different setup, but on the Ford Territory and the uh, Jaguar XF, it's up here beside the engine, then provides fuel to the high pressure fuel pump, which sits, sits in behind there. It is not electric, it's mechanically driven off a, like a cam belt. There is also a fuel cooler. There are valves built into this filter. It's not just uh, diesel passing through filter membrane, there's valves in there that are involved in temperature and pressure control. Four connections on the top, it's arrowed, so this is fuel in, this is fuel out. These two smaller connections, uh, and those are the ones that are um, involved in return flow. Um, and the theory being that those get uh, blocked somehow and that messes with the pressure. Uh, now this one, fairly straightforward to replace. Um, these push in and lift up. It's four of them. Um, this 
unclips and lifts up. There's a water sensor underneath, a little connector there that this being a more complicated filter, it is more expensive, um, but still, <laughs> I imagine you can fix all these problems just with a fuel filter. I replaced the fuel filter on my Ford Territory with one for a, a Jaguar XF. The difference is there's this indicator on the side that lines up with a arrow on the clamp, which makes sure you get the direction right. Um, that's in a different place for the Jaguar. Various manufacturers make them, including um, this one's Ford branded. I replaced mine with a Bosch fuel filter. The fuel filter is a cheap, easy one to replace. The risk you run is, is that you also have a failed lift pump in the fuel tank. You remove your old fuel filter, put in a new one. Without the low pressure pump to prime the system, you can't restart the engine. Of course, this is only going to happen if that low pressure pump is already dead. We'll listen to see if that low pressure pump is working. Here's the fuel tank on the Ford Territory. It's like a big long coffin. The pump is up under here. I will go and turn the ignition on without starting the engine so you'll be able to hear if that goes. You should be able to hear that running. And it's turned off now because it's developed pressure, which is normal. If there's no sound coming from the fuel pump before you rush out and spend a lot of money on a new one, just double check to be sure that um, those fuses aren't blown. For the, there's the fuel pump relay for the Ford Territory and, and there's the 30 amp fuse. Of course, if you're on a Land Rover or a Jag, it'll be in a different place. On the Land Rover, there are some other diagnostics you can do. Uh, I'll leave a link to the video below. Mm -hmm. on, on that vehicle, you have a, um, about here, you'll often find a uh, fuel rail pressure valve you can connect into and get some pressure readings uh, and you can work through some other diagnostics. Also, um, uh, measure the fuel outflow. I did attempt to translate that over to the Ford Territory, uh, but it didn't work. The pressure valve's not there. Also, um, measuring the fuel flow, uh, I had a, a big mess of fuel. It wasn't just the one line where fuel is coming through from the pump, connecting an OBD2 reader to the car. Um, as long as you've got a, you know, a high quality one, I actually um, uh, pay a, an auto electrician to come out and do that. Lawrence, he's, he's a master at what he does. He's got all the right gear. Uh, all of these uh, trouble codes that were logged, a huge list. You, know, you can imagine start firing the parts cannon at that list. Um, ABS modules, all sorts of things. You get yourself in a whole world of trouble. This is what the live stream looked like before I replaced the fuel filter. Fluctuating between 28,000 and 32,000 kPa at idle. And plot the rail pressure. You see it's still up and down, but it's, it's very regular, like a heartbeat. It's not um, wandering all over the place. And within a pretty tight uh, band. I'll give it a bit of a rev. Yeah, you can see that's uh, a, a good steady fuel pressure there. I think we may have fixed the problem. Uh, having a look online, there's people getting similar symptoms just from the EGR valve. What can happen is if that gets stuck open, you've essentially got a direct, direct connection from your exhaust to your intake manifold that the engine can't control. So, so you're getting all that extra gas pouring in there. You imagine that's trying to idle and run and produce power, all those sorts of things. 
if traction control is triggered, it needs to be able to control the engine. And if the engine's in limp mode, then it can't control it. So what I'll go through is uh, how to test it on the car, how to test it on the bench, um, some uh, tips and advice for finding the right parts for your vehicle, uh, and towards the end, what actually goes wrong with these valves. These two pipes with the mesh covering them, this is part of the EGR system. So there's two of them, one on each side. It's bringing in exhaust gas, hot exhaust gas, into the intake manifold. It does this when it wants to lower combustion temperature, means um, less nitrous oxide. It also has a heat exchanger down the back there um, uh, between the exhaust gas and the water cooling. Perhaps that helps the engine warm up sooner, I'm not sure, but um, uh, that's certainly part of the system as well. I'm not going to go through the full replacement of the EGR valves. That's covered in other videos. What, what I could not find was how to test if it's actually um, working properly. There is a test you can do without taking too many things apart. Uh, taking this pipe off, basically, is what you need to do. And then you'll have sufficient access and taking this connector off will give you sufficient access to test the system. So this clip comes off here. I'll explain that. Down in here, you've got two eight millimeter bolts down here. The word of warning, very easy to drop these bolts or the little gasket down the back, an extendable magnet handy ready to catch those, uh, that'll save you a lot of grief. Also a, a screw here. This clip could break. It is reusable, a few times at least, but the gasket that goes into the EGR valve itself, um, you're getting a bit of an exhaust leak if that doesn't get a good seal. Now the clips that connect the EGR through to the inlet manifold, I haven't come across these before. So the way these work, I've found this type of screwdriver to be particularly effective because you can twist, you get under there and twist and it should pop off because it's just clipping over here, right? This little hook over here. That bit that sticks out, so that's just for holding it in place, I believe. So when you get it on, you can push it up to there. Okay, and that sort of holds it in place until you get your proper pliers in. So that should all be seated now um, over your pipe where you're connecting um, and then you can lock it down. First I'll explain some of the wires that connect through to this, uh, the, some of the pinouts. So, um, so you can see there's two larger pins, three smaller ones. Anyway, they're numbered from one to six. So one and two are smaller pins three and four are larger pins, five is not there, and then it goes to six. So there's two wires that actually drive the, uh, drive the solenoid that's opening and closing the valve. So that's pin three and four. Now you've got another three wires They're telling your computer how far open the valve is. Uh, one of them is a five volt uh, constant supply and another one as a signal. Anyway, I won't go into the, that in too much detail. We will focus on pin three and four. Okay, so next we'll do some testing on the car. Uh, pretend you're doing this um, before you remove it to find out if it's working properly. So first re remove your connector from the EGR um, and then that way we can test that we've got our pins in the right place. Uh, we want to make sure we're testing the part and not whether our pins are in far enough. So the colour of the wires will depend on the car that you're working on. This is a Ford, so I'm working with the blue wire and this yellow and purple or whatever it is. Uh, your car may differ, but what will be constant will is, is that we we're dealing with the two that are inside from this blank 
and there's no wire connection. So uh, that wire there is the negative. We'll put one on here. Put a pin in that one and another pin in this one, which is the positive. Okay, and I'll just test that those are making contact before I proceed. Yep. And that one. No, I haven't got contact there, so I'm going to try that pin again. Just helps you want to eliminate that doubt of whether you're actually testing the part or not. Yep, that's good. So, um, of course, your part will be in the car. Um, this one I will connect up so we can visualize that test. Okay, so I'm just using my 9 volt battery. You can, of course, repeat this with your uh, 12 volt. Um, so again, four for the negative, three for the positive. All right, so we'll test if that's working. This time we're using 12 volts, uh, negative to the one, to the wire closest to the gap. So plenty of good strong movement there. Okay, so we'll try this again, this time with a, a bad EGR. Go. So it's just gone straight out and it's stuck. It stayed there. Now this is one that I've cleaned up. This is what it looked like. This is the other one from the other side. But believe it or not, it's still working perfectly fine with that bit of carbon in there. So what this does is this is coming, your hot air coming in from your exhaust uh, through the heat exchanger, comes into here and hits a closed valve. Now when it wants to circulate some, some exhaust gas, into the intake manifold, it opens this valve, which lets the gas in. Pin three, uh, that is your positive. Pin four, that's your negative. So you're gonna need some sort of insulated uh, connector, at least for one of them. So put that one on there. I've got a bit of space here. Okay, so what we're doing now is just checking does this thing open? I'm just using a nine volt battery, but it's enough to get a bit of movement. At least I can check that it's doing something. So it's just moving a little bit. It's not fully open, but at least it, I know it's uh, responding. Okay, so I've run the nine volt battery. So make sure that my um, wiring's connected up correctly. I don't want to short this thing. So now I'll show you this is connected to a full 12 volt car battery. And you can see that it sticks out a lot further. Now I've swapped over to the other one that was causing some trouble and uh, again full 12 volts so let's see the difference here. Okay I've taken the power away it is stuck open and it's stuck pretty good. I've got to put a bit of force on there. It may not be shiny at that part I've tried to clean this up um, but certainly that little collar um, if you've seen that part way out, then it's stuck open. It should be in that position when it's closed. And when the car's turned off, it should be in that position as well. So let's have a look inside, see how this thing works so we can get an understanding of what's going wrong here. So there's three screws holding it on. They're uh, E7, I think, uh, torque. There's, there's not much point taking this thing off on its own uh, when it's in the car. I'll come back to that, but most of the problem seems to be here. And this is all sold as one piece anyway. So it's just doing this motion, twisting motion is what the motor does. And what it's twisting is this. See there's those little slots and this body on the side with the little bearing in there that runs around. So it's just the motion of twisting that produces a cam motion and pushes it down. You've got a wearing surface in here, see that's flopping around in there. 
You've got a little bearing there, which is running on this surface, and another little bearing there. So with that one, two, three wearing parts there, you've also got a, a wearing surface in here um, where it's driving in and out. And all of this is running dry. There's no oil in here at all. Okay, this is just um, fending for itself a little bit in a pretty hot environment um, to push this thing out. So just open, close. When I get to here, so trying to push back, it won't move back. So this is all cleaned up. There's no carbon in here. It's not stuck on anything. It's all pretty clean. Spent quite a while cleaning it. From what I can work out, this is simply this. There's all these wearing surfaces in here, right? <clears throat> My guess is they just get so much play in there that they sort of bind up. So I can't actually shut that one even with the tool. I've got to push from the other end on the here. And I can pop it back. So, so in my case, <clears throat> it really is simply worn out. These wearing surfaces in here um, are pretty bad. <clears throat> now, you, you can see in here, I've, I've had a bit of go at, at grinding in here. I thought maybe it just needed a bit more space. It made no difference with 250 odd thousand kilometers on it. It is just wearing out. Okay, some tips on ordering parts. These parts and numbers only apply to the 2.7 litre diesel. Uh, the 3 litre has a completely different um, EGR system. My one, not surprisingly, therefore has a Ford part number on it. Now these are mirrored, so there's a different one left and right. I did change these at some point on the 2.7. They changed, uh, I, I believe, from Euro 3 to Euro 4 emission standards, they changed the part. So this is off a 2011 Ford Territory. It should be the Euro 4 one. Uh, different part number left and right. So this is your Ford part number, which is, is written on, uh, certainly on my EGRs, probably on all of them. You'll find searching on the internet though, you probably have more luck finding the Land Rover uh, it listed under the Land Rover part number. Uh, these are the part numbers I could find for the Euro 3 one. If you check in under there with a the mirror, see if you can spot those first four numbers. Is it a 4R8Q or is it a 7H2Q? Where can you go to buy them? Wander down to your local Ford or Land Rover dealer. Some other options you can get very cheap ones on the Chinese website, your AliExpress, places like that. I can't talk for the quality. They're certainly, um, you know, they're very cheap, like um, less than a hundred bucks for two of them. Uh, I, the other place I found was uh, Spear 2. Um, I've ordered some off there. They have, actually they're quite impressive. They have quite a few different uh, aftermarket brands you can get there, including the original, which um, Valio, you can see here Valio is the uh, original equipment manufacturer for this Ford Territory at least. The only caution I'd offer there is there's probably lots of places you can pay high prices for what are essentially just those um, Chinese parts off AliExpress. We're all back together now. I've replaced both EGR valves. Testing showed that it was only one of them. Okay, turn the motor off. All right, so far we have no lights. All right, seems to be running. We don't have any check engine lights. Okay, it's been a week or two and uh, I've given us uh, at least a dozen drives and no check engine light seems to be fixed good luck with yours you may have other problems of course but um, hope this helps